All right, chapter 11, The Servant's Arms. Upon the same day that this event took place, Mr. Whittingham, the butler of Richard Markham, yeah, I've been waiting for the butler to come back, had solicited and obtained permission to pass the evening with a certain Mr. Thomas Sudgett, who occupied the distinguished post of valet de chambre about the person of the Honorable Arthur Chichester. <laughs> Guys, this is getting so interconnected. Whittingham was determined to enjoy himself. He seemed suddenly to have cast off twenty years from his back, and to walk the more upright for having rid himself of the burden. His hat was slightly cocked on one side, and as he walked along with Mr. Thomas Suggett, tucked under his arm, he struck his silver-headed bamboo, which he always carried with him when he went abroad on Sundays and holidays very forcibly upon the pavement. Mr. Suggett declared that for his part he was very well disposed for a spree, and he threw into his gait a most awful swagger, which certainly excited considerable attention, because all the small boys in the streets laughed at him as he wended on his way. I wonder what them urchins are garping at so, said Whittingham. It mystificates me in no inconsiderable degree. Really, the lower orders of English is exceedingly impolite. I feel the most invigorated disgust and the most unboundless contempt for their manners. That's just like me, observed Suggett. I can't abear the lower orders. I hate everything vulgar. But by the by, Mr. Whittingham, do you smoke? I can't say but what I like a full-flavored Havana, a threepenny mind, added the butter pom butler pompously. Just my taste, Mr. Whittingham. If I can't afford three pennies, I won't smoke at all. Mr. Suckett entered a cigar shop, purchased half a dozen real Havanas manufactured in St. John Street, Clerkenwell. <laughs> so they weren't really Havana cigars. Joked with the young lady who served him and then presented the one which he considered the best to his companion. The two gentlemen's gentlemen accordingly lighted their cigars and then continued their walk along the new road in the vicinity of which Mr. Whittingham had met Mr. Suggett by appointment upon this memorable afternoon. In a short time, Mr. Suckett stopped suddenly at the door of a large white public house, not a hundred miles distant from the new church, St. Pancras. This is a nice crib, said he. Excellent company, and tonight there is a supper at eleven. The very identified thing, acquiesced Mr. Whittingham, and into the public house they walked. Nothing could be more neat and cleanly than the bar of the servant's arm. No one more obliging or bustling than the young lady behind the bar. The servant's arms was reported to draw the best liquor in all the neighborhood, and its landlord prided himself upon the superiority of his establishment over those which sold beer at three pence a pot in your own jugs. And then what a rapid draught the landlord had for all his good things and how crowded was the space before the bar with customers. Pot a porter and master's compliments. And can you lend him yesterday's advertiser for half an hour or so? Said a pretty little servant girl, placing a large yellow jug on the bright lead surface of the bar. Pot of ale and a screw, miss. Pint of gin for mixing, please. Bottle of Cape wine at 18, landlord. Four penneth of rum, cold without. Half pint of porter and a pipe, Caroline. Such were the orders, issued from all quarters at the same moment, and to which Caroline responded with incredible alacrity, finding time to crack a joke with the known frequenters of the house and to make a pleasant observation upon the weather to those whose faces were strange to her. While the landlord contented himself with looking on, or every now and then drawing a pot of beer, apparently as a great favor and in a lazy, independent manner. Nevertheless, he was a good, civil kind of man, only somewhat independent because he was growing rich. He was never afraid at the end of the month to see Truman and Hanbury's collector and Nicholson's man alight from their gigs at his door. They were always sure to find the money ready for them when they sat down to write their receipts in the little narrow slip of a parlor behind the bar. In fact, the landlord of the servant's arms was reported to be doing a very snug business, and so he was. Mr. Whittingham and Suggett sauntered leisurely into the parlor of the servants' arms and took their seat at the only table which remained unoccupied. "'Good evening, sir,' said the waiter, addressing Mr. Suggett with a sort of semi-familiarity, which showed that the latter gentleman was in the habit of using the house. "'How are you, William?' cried Mr. Suggett in a patronizing manner. "'George, been here lately?' "'Not very. I think he's down in the country.' "'Oh, well, what shall we have, Mr. Whittingham? Brandy and water?' "'That's my invariable beverage, Mr. Suggett. Two sixes, gentlemen,' said the waiter. "'No,' answered Mr. Whittingham solemnly. Two shillings worth to begin with.' 
The liquor was supplied, and when the two gentlemen had tasted it and found it to their liking, they glanced around the room to survey the company. It soon appeared that Mr. Suggett was well known to many of the gentlemen present, for upon making his survey, he acknowledged with a nod or a short phrase the bows or salutations of those with whom he was acquainted. "'Ah, oh, Mr. Guffin's always up in the same corner, eh?' said he, addressing a middle-aged man in seedy black. "'Got a new work in the press, suppose? You literary men contrive to enjoy yourselves, I know.' "'How do you do, Mr. McChisel?' looking toward a short, pockmarked man with a quick gray eye and black hair combed upright off his forehead. "'How get on the clients? Plenty of business, eh?' "'Ay, you lawyers contri always contrive to do well. Mr. Drummer, your servant, sir. Got a good congregation still, sir?' The chapel thriveth well, I thank you, as well as can be expected in these times of heathen abominations, answered a demure-looking middle-aged gentleman who was clad in deep black and wore a white neckcloth, which seemed, together with the condition of his shirt and stockings, to denote that, although he had gained the confidence of his flock, he had certainly lost that of his washerwoman. <laughs> After having taken a long draught of a pint of half and half, which stood before him, he added, there is a many savory vessels in my congregation, reputable, pious, and prayerful people, which pays regular for their sittings and fears the Lord. Well, I am glad of that, said Mr. Suggett. But ah, he cried, observing a thin, white-haired old gentleman with huge silver spectacles hanging halfway down his nose. I'm glad to see Mr. Cobbington here. How gets on the circulating library, eh, sir? Pretty well, pretty well, thank ye, returned the bookseller. Pretty well, considering... A great many people qualified their observations and answers by ad by the addition of the word considering. But they seldom vouchsafe an explanation of what it is to be considered. <laughs> Sometimes they use the phrase considering all things, and then the mind has so much to consider that it cannot consider any one thing definitively. It would be much more straightforward and satisfactory if persons would relieve their friends of all suspense and say boldly at once, as the case may be, considering the execution I have got in my house, or considering the writ that's out against me, or even considering the trifling annoyance of not having a shilling in my pocket and not knowing where to look for one. But somehow or another, people never will be candid nowadays. And Talleyrand was right when he said that language was given to man to enable him to conceal his thoughts. But to continue... Mr. Suggett glanced a little further around the room and recognized another old acquaintance. Ah, Snoggles, how are you? Very well, thank you. How be you? Blooming, but how come you here? I dropped in quite promiscuously, answered Snoggles, and finding good company, stayed. But it is upwards of three years since I see you, Mr. Suggett. About? What grade do you now fill in the profession? Any promotion? I'm sorry to say not, replied Mr. Snoggles, shaking his head mournfully. I've tumbled off the box down to a level with the osses which being interpreted means that Mr. Snoggles had fallen from the high estate of coachman to the less elevated rank of ostler. But what rank do you now hold? I left off the uniform of Tiger last month, answered Mr. Suggett, and received the brave of Wally de Chamber. <laughs> Valet de Chambre. Wally de Chamber, love it. That gentleman, one of the profession, demanded Snoggles, alluding to Mr. Whittingham. Mr. Markham's butler, sir, at your service, said, Miss, said Whittingham, bowing with awe-inspiring stiffness. And I may say without exaggerating, sir, and in no wise compromising my indefatigable character for veracity, that I'm also Mr. Markham's confidential friend. And what's more, gentlemen, added the butler, glancing profoundly around the room, Mr. Richard Markham is the finest young man about this stupendous city of the whole universe, and that's as true as that is a hand." As Mr. Whittingham concluded this sentence, he extended his arm to display the hand relative to which he expressed such confidence, and while he flourished the arm to give weight to his language, the aforesaid hand encountered the right eye of the descending parson. <laughs> A case of assault and battery, instantly exclaimed Mr. Mac Chisel, the lawyer, and here are upwards of a dozen witnesses for the plaintiff. I really beg the gentleman's pardon, said Whittingham. Special jury, sittings after term, damages 500 pounds, exclaimed Mac Chisel. No harm was intended, observed Suggett. Not a bit, added Snoggles. Verdict for plaintiff, enter up judgment, issue execution in no time, said McChisel doggedly. I am used to flagellations and persecutions at the hands of the ungodly, said the Reverend Mr. Drummer, rubbing his eye with his fist and thereby succeeding in inflaming it. Perhaps the revered gentleman wouldn't take it amiss if I was to offer him my apologies and an extra powerful glass of brandy and water, exclaimed Whittingham. Bribery, murmured McChisel. <laughs> "'No, let us have a bowl of punch at once,' exclaimed Suggett. "'And corruption,' added the lawyer. "'The bowl of punch was ordered, and the company was invited to partake of it. 
Even Mr. McChisel did not hesitate, and the dissenting minister, in order to convince Mr. Whittingham that he entirely forgave him, consented to partake of the punch so often that he at length began slapping Mr. Whittingham upon the back and declaring that he was the best fellow in the world. The conversation became general, and some of it is worth recording. <laughs> I hope to have your patronage, sir, for my circulating library, said Mr. Coppington to the butler. Depends, sir, upon the specified nature of the books it contains, was the reply. I have nothing but moral romances in which vice is always punished and virtue rewarded. That, conducts of, that conduct of yours is highly credulous to you. All books is trash except one, observed Mr. Drummer, winking his eyes in an extraordinary manner. They teach us naught but swearing, lewd conversation, ungodliness, and the worst of all vices, intemperance. <laughs> he says as he's drunk. <laughs> I beg you to understand, sir, exclaimed Mr. Guffins, who had hitherto remained a silent spectator of the proceedings, although a persevering partaker of the punch. I beg you to understand, Mr. Drummer, my work, sir, are not the trash you seem to allude to. I won't understand nothing nor nobody, answered the reverend gentleman, swaying backward and forward in his chair. Leave me to commune with myself upon the vanities of this wicked world and, and drink my punch in quiet. Humbug, exclaimed the literary man, swallowing his resentment, and the remainder of his punch simultaneously. Ah, said the bookseller after a pause, nothing now succeeds unless it's in the comic line. We have comic Latin grammars and comic Greek grammars, indeed. I don't know but what English grammar, too, is a comedy altogether. All our tragedies are made into comedies by the way they are performed, and no work sells without comic illustrations to it. I have brought out several new comic works which have been very successful. For instance, the comic Wealth of Nations, the comic Parliamentary Speeches, the comic Report of the Poor Law Commissioners, with an appendix containing the comic Dietary Scale and the comic Distresses of the Industrious Population. I even propose to bring out a comic Whole Duty of Man. All these books sell well. They do admirably for the nurseries of the children of the aristocracy. In fact, they are as good as manuals and textbooks. This rage for the comic is most unexpressedly remarkable, observed the butler. It is indeed, said Snoggles, and in order to illustrate the truth of the statement, he jerked a piece of lemon peel very cleverly into the dissenting parson's, parson's left eye. That's right, stone me to death, murmured the reverend gentleman. My name is Stephen, and it is all for righteousness' sake. I know I'm a chosen vessel and may become a martyr. My name is Stephen, I tell you, Stephen drum mummer <laughs> He then began an eulogium upon meekness and resignation under injuries and reiterated his conviction that he was a chosen vessel. But becoming suddenly excited by a horse laugh which fell upon his ear, he forgot all about the chosen vessel and lifted another very... And lifted another from the table. In a word, he seized a pewter pot in his hand and would have hurled it at Mr. Snoggle's head had not Mr. Whittingham stopped the dangerous missile in time and pacified the reverend gentleman by calling for more punch. <laughs> we must certainly have these two men bound over to keep the peace, said McChisel. Two sureties in fifty and themselves in a hundred each. I shall dress the whole scene up for one of the monthlies, observed Mr. Guffins. If you do, you'll be indictable for libel, said McChisel. The greater the truth, the greater the libel. In the meantime, Suggett and his friend Snoggles drew close to each other and entered into conversation. It must be about three years since I saw you last, said the latter. Three years come January, observed Suggett. Ah, I've seen some strange wissitudes in the interval, continued Snoggles. I went abroad as coachman with a dashing young chap of the name of Winchester. The devil you did. How singular. Why, my present governor's name is Chichester. Well, I does say they're cousins then, <laughs> said the ostler. <laughs> but I hope Yern won't treat you as mine did me. He seemed to have no end of tin for some months and lived, my eye, how he lived. King's bench dinners ain't nothing to what his'n was. And yet I've heard say that the prisoners lived there better than their creditors outside. Howsomever, things didn't always go on swimmingly. We went to Baden, called so because of the baths, and there my governor got involved in some gambling transactions as forced him to make his name Walker. Well, he bolted, leaving all his traps behind and me amongst them, and not a skurrick to pay the hotel bill and find my way back again to England. The landlord, he seized the traps, and I was forced to walk all the way to, I forget the name of the place, Constantinople, perhaps, said Suggett, kindly endeavoring to assist his friend in his little geographical embarrassments. "'No, that ain't it,' returned Snuggles. 
Howsomever, I had every kind of difficulty to fight up against, and I never see my governor from that day to this. He owed me eight pounds, nineteen, and sixpence for wages, and he was bound by contract to bring me back to England. Disgraceful rascal that he was, said Mr. Suggett. I really think that we gentlemen ought to establish a society for our protection. The licensed whittlers have their association. Why shouldn't we have the gentleman's gentlemen organized into a society? Why not, said Snoggles. The waiter now acquainted the company that supper was ready in an upstairs room for those who liked to partake of it. All the gentlemen, whose names have been introduced to the reader in connection with the parlor of the servants' arms, removed to the banqueting saloon, where the table was spread with white cloth and black-handled knives and forks. At intervals stood salt cellars and pepper boxes, the latter resembling in shape the three little domes upon the present National Gallery in Trafalgar Square. A huge round of boiled beef tripe, both boiled and fried, and rump steaks formed the supper. The Methodist parson insisted upon being allowed to say grace, or as he expressed it, ask a blessing, for which purpose the same neighbors who had kindly helped him up the stairs now sustained him upon his legs. <laughs> He's too drunk to pray. <laughs> Dread was the havoc then made upon the various dainties on the table, Mr. MacGuffin's being especially characterized by a good appetite upon this occasion. The Reverend Mr. Drummer was also far from being behindhand in this onslaught upon the luxuries supplied by the servants' arms, and while he bolted huge mouthfuls of boiled beef, he favored the company with an excellent moral dissertation upon... <laughs> abstemiousness and self-mortification. Mr. Drummer was, however, one of those who content themselves with inculcating mor morality and do not consider it necessary to set an example in their own persons. <laughs> so he doesn't practice what he preaches. For after having clearly demonstrated that gluttony and drunkenness lead to blasphemy, ungodliness, and profane swearing, he abruptly turned to the landlord who presided at the supper table and, holding his plate to be filled for the fourth time, exclaimed, Don't cut it so infernally thick. <laughs> After supper, glasses round of hot brandy and water were introduced, and the conversation was carried on with considerable spirit. It was midnight before the party thought of breaking up, although several of the gentlemen present had already begun to see three or four Dutch clocks staring them in the face, besides the one which graced the wall. <laughs> they're so drunk they're seeing double and triple. Oh, as for the Reverend Mr. Drummer, he declared that he was so affected by the ungodly proceedings of those present that he should forthwith endeavor to wash away their guilt with his tears. And it is distressing to be compelled to observe that all the reward this truly pious and deserving man experienced at the hands of the ungrateful company was the cruel accusation that he was crying drunk. This disgraceful behavior produced such an effect upon his naturally nervous temperament that he fell fat on the, flat on the floor and was compelled to be taken in a wheelbarrow to his own house close by. We may also add here that on the following day this proceeding was rumored abroad so that the much injured minister was necessitated necessitated to justify his conduct from the pulpit on the ensuing Sabbath. This he did so effectually that two old ladies who carried small flasks of brandy in their pockets were conveyed out of the chapel in a peculiar state, no doubt overpowered by the minister's eloquence. They, however, recovered at the expiration of some hours and immediately opened a subscription to present a piece of plate to the Reverend Stephen Drummer, together with a vote of thanks and confidence on the part of the congregation. The vote was respectfully but gratefully declined by this holy man, but after some little entreaty he was prevailed upon to accept the plate, and is considered by his flock to be a chosen and savory vessel of the Lord. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, it seems like such a weird aside, like a scene that has nothing to do with anything else, but I suspect it will play a role in it later on. We have... um the good friend of Richard's butler, who is the valet of Mr. Chichester, who is working very hard to become Richard's friend. And, um, and he talked about with someone else about a George that they knew who's not around because he's out in the country, which makes me wonder if it's a George we already know. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but I have a feeling that's going to play a role again coming up down the road. All right. See you tomorrow for chapter 12. Thank you.